Hello, everyone, and welcome to this on-demand webinar series. Today, we'll talk about sample preparation for the forensic light microscopy. My name is Yibing, Sector Marketing for Life Science in China. I will present this webinar for you today. This webinar will take approximately 40 minutes, including four sections. First, is to introduce the basic knowledge of sample preparation workflow for light microscopy. And then we'll talk about labeling and staining for furnace dyes and protein, and how to choose the right one for your experiment. In the last part, we'll have some discussions about relevant common questions. Now, let's start. If you ever read the National Geographic magazine, you'll be certainly attracted by those impressive photos. Then you will be inspired and think about, I also want to do that by myself. So where can we start? Your skill and talent is surely important. But also, you need to go to a beautiful place or have a moved moment with professional equipment could record that. So, what about a nice microscopic image? If we want to clearly observe and understand what happens in the micro world, we need to do well sample preparation and choose a right microscopy for imaging. In the other webinar presented by my colleagues, you could learn which microscopy is the best for your research. Since the system can only see what is in the sample, Sample preparation is the foundation of all, which is super important. So today, we'll focus on the topic, how to prepare your sample for forensic light microscopy imaging. Let's start with the first part, sample preparation workflow for light microscopy. Most of the biology samples are tissues or cells. The typical workflow for sample preparation of tissue, including fixing, dehydrating, then followed by embedding, sectioning, staining, and finally mounting. The methodology of sample preparation for animal and plant material has a little difference. The following descriptions related to animal tissues. Steps for cultured cells will be much more simple. Only fixing, staining, and mounting. We'll introduce each step in the following slides. First step, fixation. So why do we need fixation? Once living tissue stop blood circulation and metabolism, it will cause biochemical and histological changes due to the metabolism disorders. This means they're not able to maintain their structures anymore. The aim for fixation is to maintain the original structure for further starting. This fixative will slowly penetrate the tissue causing chemical and physical changes that will harden and preserve the tissue to protect it against the foreign processing steps. Ideally, specimens should remain in fixative for long enough for the fixative to penetrate into every part of the tissue. The table in this slide shows us a virus commonly used fixing agent in the lab. There are a limited number of reagents that can be used for fixation. They must possess particular properties that make them suitable for this purpose. For marine, the most popular fixative for preserving tissues that will be processed to prepare paraffin sections. For different experiments proposed, you could choose different fixing agents for the best result. Please make sure to choose the auto forensic free fixative in order to have a clean background in forensic imaging. The aim of dehydration is to remove water from tissues with ethanol or sucrose solution. Because the melted paraffin wax is hydrophobic, most of the water in a specimen must be removed 
before it can be infiltrated with wax. This process is commonly carried out by immersing specimens in a series of isonal solutions of increasing concentration until pure water-free alcohol is reached. A series of increasing concentrations is used to avoid excessive distortions of tissue. Table in this slide shows a typical dehydration sequence. Factioning refers to the preparation of rainbow-like microtomes of a tissue for the purpose of mounting it on the microscopic slide for examination. The process of embedding period to sectioning is to enhance easier extraction of circular structures. Some of times we use scratch preparation instead of sectioning. What is that? Scratch means the cells are intentionally scratched or crushed onto a slide to reveal their contents. For example, botanical specimens. The cells are disrupted to reveal the chromosomes. Although scratch preparations provide details about individual cells and the relative cell numbers, but structural relationships are lost. While sections preserve the structural relationship between individual cells and extracellular components. So here we only focus on sectioning. Here are two primary methods embedding tissues for sectioning. They are vacuum, wax, and frozen tissues. You have also heard about resin before. Since this method is only for electron microscopy, we are not talking about it today. Each of these methods has its own set of advantages and limitations. Which tissue embedding medias to use really come down to how you plan to use your embedded tissue. Some of you uses overlap, so check out the chart on the slide to see how they differ and what to expect with each technique. The choice of embedding media for tissue depends on type of tissue, type of microtome, type of microscopy to examine the tissue. Liquid paraffin is the most commonly used embedding media in histopathology laboratory. We call it IHCP. On the right column, IHCF, frozen tissue, should be stored at minus 80 degree and then embedded in OCT before sectioning. So here OCT refers to optimal cutting temperature. So let's look at them in details. Paraffin embedding tissues can be stored long term at room temperature, while the frozen tissue can only be stored at minus 80 degree for up to one year. Frozen tissue can be affected by the formation of, of, a quail, of, of ice crystal, which can be affect subcircular details and impact IHC standing. Another potential drawback of the frozen tissues is the thickness of the section. Compared to the paraffin embedded sections, frozen tissues are thicker, reducing the ability to capture tissue morphology after microscopy in details. However, cryopreservation is thought to be better preserved antigens and antigenicity. The study of the post-translationary modified protein, DNA or RNA, is also recommended on frozen tissue. So normally, paraffin embedding is thought to be better preserve morphology details. Cryopreservation is considered to be better preserve en enzyme and antigen expression. The optimal method for each experiment should be determined by considering the nature of antigen and its subcircular location and desired method of detection among the other factors. Now. If we examine our specimen under microscopy, they appear colorless and offer little in the way of information. To improve the contrast, we could stain the sections and highlight important features with both cells and the tissues. There are many principal staining techniques, like most famous one, etch staining. It is used most 
routinely in pathology laboratory. It could stand sample using dye directly. However, this is only for bright field microscopy imaging. We also have other special staining methods, which covers a wide variety of methods that may be used to visualize particular tissue structures, elements, which could not be identified by HE staining. Here we take immunoreferences assay as the sample. Normally three steps are required for that, antigen retrieval, blocking, and staining. So we start with antigen retrieval first. When the fixative are used, the cross-linking of proteins leads to masking of the antigen sites, and this leads to a weaker IHC staining. The antigen retrieval process serves to break the protein cross-links and unmask the epitopics. The commonly used antigen retrieval technicals are through heat-induced methods and potentially retrieval methods. Barking. The non-specific binding cross is high background staining that can mask the detection of the target antigen. This could potentially lead to false positive results. To reduce background staining, the samples are incubated with a buffer that blocks the non-specific sites. Common blocking buffers include some this kind of percentage of things. Many commercial blocking buffers are available for greater blocking efficiency, so you could just buy it. Finally, we go to staining. There are three different ways for staining. Immersing, ripping, floating. Immersing is widely used in HE staining, while the dripping is commonly used in RFA staining. Floating, normally for tissue with large volume and higher thickness. Immune forensics relies on the use of antibodies, chemically labeled with fluorescent dyes, to visualize molecules within fixed cells or tissue specimens under light microscopy. This process can reveal the localization, relative expression, and even activation states of target proteins. The power of immune forensics is to provide info within both graphic and quantified data. For successful IF staining, it is crucial to have a good antibody that can well specifically detect antigens within the molecule of interest. There are two different types of that, direct IF and indirect IF. For the direct IF, this primary antibody is linked to forensic dye. Indirect IF use two antibodies. The unlabeled primary antibody specifically binds to target molecules. And for the secondary antibody, which carries the form for, and recognize the primary antibodies and conjugate it to it. Multiple secondary antibodies can bind a single primary antibody. Since the number of forensic molecules can be bound to the primary antibody is limited, direct IF is substantially less sensitive than indirect IF and may result of false negatives. Direct IF also requires to use much more primary antibodies, which is extremely expensive. Most of the time, we need two or more proteins to mark the for imaging. Both approaches we mentioned on the last slide allowed us to do the multi pattern for this imaging. Here are some rules to help us to choose the antibodies for that. For the primary antibody, it is better to choose antibodies with different host species. For example, rabbit antibody A, mouse antibody B, rat antibody C. So you could stand in now simultaneously and save your time. If we have to use several antibodies from one host, we should stand in sequentially, ordered by the following steps. Primary antibody A, secondary antibody with short blocking, 
and do another antibodies right now. As for the second of antibodies here, we recommend to choose the antibodies from the same host species with simultaneous stainings to save the time. If the antibodies are from the different host, we need also staining sequentially. For more detailed introductions about forensic labeling, we'll talk about that on the next section on this talk. Now, we could go to the final step, mounting, to preserve and support standing sections for light microscopy. Our specimen is mounted on clear glass slide and covered with a thin glass cover slip. The slide and cover slip must be free optical distortions to avoid any artifacts. A mounting media is used to adhere the cover slip to the slide. We recommend to choose a high quality anti forensic culture or the anti fade media for the mounting. The diagram on the right side shows the comparison between different dyes with and without using anti fade media. The green lines here indicate with anti fade mount mounting media, while the red lines here as the control without anti fade media. So it is very clearly to show that from this experiment, without any anti fade media, the forensics will qu quickly be crouched. Another thing I want to mention here, we need to try to avoid any bubbles of acrylate structures when we are mounting. Now we've already shared the main steps in the typical sample preparation workflow for light microscopy. We encourage all of you to take serious on each of the steps, practice and optimize them. In the second part, we'll talk more details about forensic labeling and staining. Viewing cells with white light only allows you to see so much. By selectively labeling proteins, structures, or biological process, with for instance proteins, dyers, or conjugated antibodies, what you can observe and track will increase dramatically. The for instance probes have a major impact on microscopy because specific molecules and organs can be stained. They are genetically codable and provide a relative direct link from molecule, so the cell could be into colors so that we can directly see. Learn about forensic dyes and proteins are important, and see how they can be used in functional and structural cell analysis studies. It is a brilliant colored solution. You can use it to trace the flow in the ground rivers. So we will start a journey of fun that you can have these multicolored living inks made out of forces standing with high contrast. You may heard about the Braskin diagram about the principle of forensics before. So now just remind you how the forensics works. Now you have a forensic for It is staying there right now on the ground stage, the lowest energy level. The light goes in as an energy, so it can raise the energy level of the forensic for and shoot it to a higher level of energy. This process we call it excitation. And now this form four, he wants to go back to the ground state. So now he has to re release some additional energy. So the energy will be emitted as another light. We call it forensic light. Before it emits the forensic light, it has already had some little loss of energies here in a higher level of energy. This means the energy carried by the excitation light and the emitted forensic light is different, which means their wavelength is different. Because the longer wavelength has a lot has lower energy, so normally the wavelength of forensic light is longer than the excitation light. 
So now we'll talk about how the wavelength is determined. This is what you see in this graph. Excitation and emission spectral profiles. So here's the frequency of the event and the wavelength of the light. One is excitation curve and another one is emission curve. Let's clarify a concept first. We often like to say that, for example, GFP can be excited by 488 excitation light. So that, that means the 404 can only excite it with single or narrow wavelengths? The answer is no. In fact, we can see here, each 404 has an excitation spectrum and emission spectrum. The dial can be excited by the light in a certain wavelength range. And the emitted light has a corresponding wavelength range as well, not just a single wavelength. As we often see in such words on the dial catalogs, like here, EX4980 nanometers and EM5320 nanometers. Here, EX and EM stand for the excitation light and the emitted light. And the number here is usually referred to the wavelengths of the highest points of the excitation and emission curve. Most of the time, we like to say this way. My sample is standing with green, for instance, or red, for instance. So here, the color we are talk, talking about is actually the color of emitted light, like lecture 488 is green. Now we could come to another important factor, the difference between these two points, the highest point of excitation and emission curve. This is known as stock shift. Because if you use a filter to get rid of the excitation light and only immediately emission, this gap or the width of this gap is quite important. So that you can easily get rid of the excitation light, which is useless or even harmful to the imaging. Most of the forensic signal detectors are black and white detectors. The colors in publications are mostly added with fake colors. So it is more important to understand the original excitation and emission spectra for a given form form. Forensis has been used in biological research for the last 100 years. The vast selection of foreign forests today provide greater flexibility variation and a form for performance for research applications than ever before. Foreign force can be divided into three general groups, organic dyers, biological foreign force, or sometimes we call it forensic supportings, and quantum dots. Each foreign force has distinct characteristics, which should be considered when deciding which foreign force to use for a given application or experimental systems. We'll talk all of them in details in the following slides. Organic dyes. Synthetic organic dyes such as were the first forensic compounds used in biological research. Derivatives of these original compounds have been produced to improve the photostability and the solubility. These dyes also derivatized for using bioconjugation especially FITC, rhodamine, commercial variants with greater performance. The small size of these forms is benefit over biological foreign forms for bioconjugation strategy, because they can cross-link to large molecules, such as antibodies, biotin, avidin, without interfering with proper biological function. Let's talk about biological foreign forms. Uh, we call it forensic proteins. Here the picture is, of course, the jellyfish. And this jellyfish is where it all began. And in a way, these are the creatures that we most have to thank. There was a very interesting, nice story behind of that. While the bioluminescence has been known for thousands of years, 
the first use of biological fluorophore for the search application occurred in 1990s. When the green forest protein, GFP, was cloned from the jellyfish and used as gene expression reporter. Since that time, the derivatives of the original GFP and many other proteins have been designed for use in biological expression systems, and their use is now commonplace in biological research. The benefits of these types of foreign force is that expression plasmids can be introduced into either bacteria, cells, organs, or the whole organisms to drive the expressions of that foreign force either alone or fused to a protein of interest in the context of biological process study, which means living cell imaging is possible now. However, the use of the forensic proteins can be time consuming and expressing large amounts of light producing proteins can generate reactive oxygen species and induce artifactual response or toxicity. Additionally, the size of forensic protein can change the normal biological function of the circular protein to which the phosphor is fused. And the biological phosphors do not typically provide the photostability and the sensitivity at the same level of forensic dyers, which is much weaker. The original jellyfish protein actually was not very strongly influenced. Researchers need to improve protein and make it more stable. It took over about 30 years until the advent of a recombinant DNA, as well as vastly improved molecular biological approaches. Protein then developed into a useful tool for live cell imaging. We have witnessed a truly remarkable expansions in the forensic protein family, largely driven by the innovation studies from larger chains laboratory. Most of the forensic proteins are commonly used today have been modified to optimize their expression in biological systems. Continued efforts improve the spectral characteristics, photostability, maturity time, brightness, acid resistance, and utilize the forensic protein tags for the circular imaging. Then gradually made the protein able to tolerate warmer temperature and for the more efficiency. The decisions of these improved proteins are the ones that everyone uses nowadays, including a very popular so-called EGFP. E standing for the enhance here. There was a lot of interest in getting other colors, for many reasons. The very simplest is that sometimes you want to follow several different proteins simultaneously. By making them different colors, we can distinguish all of them easily. Eventually now, it has been possible for the chemist to build serious dyes to cover the whole visible structure like this. All the way out of here, from the UV, ultraviolet, cyan, green, yellow, orange, red, and into the far red. So this is usually used for spectrum we have in microscopy. The green pointing families here is mainly from the jellyfish we talked about before, and while the red ones is mainly from the coral. For easier to remember those different beautiful red colors, Scientists give them a very nice, good name, fruits. With each color reference, like this one, I'm cherry, and this one, I'm strawberry. When choosing the forensic proteins for live cell images, the wavelength excitation is very important. Also, the wavelengths for the light needed to excite the blue and the cayenne forensic proteins are often damaging the cells in long-term image experiments. So if you want to do the live cell imaging experiments, red and orange will be better. Here I just want to mention very briefly a complete different kind of form for here, quantum dots. They have become very popular for certain kind of experiments. 
Quantum doors are nanoscale size semiconductors from normally from 2 to 15 nanometers. There are many benefits from them. First, we know a board emission is a common problem with organic form form because these will increase spectral overlap if more than one form form is used for experiment. The good thing for, for the quantum dots, their size can be tightly controlled. And also, their emission wavelengths are depends on their size. So this makes them precisely tenable and could be narrowed down their emission peaks to reduce the cross talk in the, in the imagery. In addition, quantum dots have a very broad excitation with an increased absorbance in, in the blue range. This allows a greater freedom for selecting the excitation stars and give rise to an apparently large stock shift. And these semiconductors, these core shear nano crystals can highly for instance, it's super bright, much higher than the small molecule for the force. Also, amazing with these molecules, they don't photo bleach at all. This is incredibly useful for some applications. For example, tracking single molecules on the, on the cell surface, or also in some biophysical applications. Considering the wide variety of forensic staining, how do we choose which one to use for the particular application? In this section, we'll talk about how to choose the right forensic probes for your experiment. In the table on this slide, these are the forensic labels that are quite popular on this market. So how can we choose the best one from there for our experiment? Here are some factors for you to consider. First, capability with the design of experiment. Each dial is unique and have different functionality. Excitation, wavelengths, emission wavelengths, band shape, photostability, and all of those things. To ensure success, choose one is the most suitable to the design of your experiment. Second, capability with other for instance materials in the sample. In double or triple labeling experiments, the emission and excitation profile of your chosen dial should not overlap with the other form force. Since many naturally occurring cell components have auto for instance, and sometimes even bad, and they are at the same wavelength as your chosen dial or parts. So now you need to make sure that you can clearly identify the signals produced by your chosen dial from the background autoferences. The last, capability with the equipment. Choose a dial that matches the illumination sources you are using. In choosing appropriate forensic instrument, consider the instrument's sensitivity, dynamic range, stability, Single to noise ratios and all of these factors. For even better results, please make sure that the emission profile of your diet matches the available of detection methods. When designing experiments using Francis probes, we should ensure that the highest possible signal levels are achieved in order to have the best image quality still. The brightness of Francis probes is determined by the number of factors, including the efficiency and the rate of maturity, and the level of protein expression, the extinction coefficient levels within excitation wavelength range, and the quantum yard. Here at the list, we have some we list some common used proteins there for you to check there how the brightness is. In addition, when you imaging with microscopy, the forensic filter combinations, spectral distribution of emission source, and the digital camera parameters, all of those things play a very important role there. So for how to choose the right microscopy to imaging, you could find more details in force in the other webinars there.
The death of labor cells in microscopic imaging can suffer from a number of factors. All of these, the light damage or phototoxicity can occur upon the repeated exposure by illumination from lasers and high intensity lamps. In excited state, fluorescent molecules tend to react with molecular oxygen to produce free radicals that can damage subcircular components and the entire cell. Long-time elimination of cells can result in physiological changes and eventually cause the cell death. So, it is good to choose the fluorescent pops with higher photostability, especially for the live cell imaging. Oligomerization of protein refers to interactions of more than one polypeptide chains. Dimer, trimer, and tetramers are, for example, oligomers composed of two, three, and four monomers, respectively. And this is generally bad when we want to tag a particular protein. They could lead to protein aggregation and poor circular localization that often changes the cell biology and the mass things up. Poor localization of forensic fusions can sometimes be corrected by choosing another forensic protein or by changing the location of fusions in plasmid. In the last section, we'll have some discussions on some common questions in sample preparation. The first common problem is high background in your sample. It is caused by many reasons. First, please make sure you use the high specific primary antibodies. Sometimes the high concentration of antibodies could also give you a high background. Check your sample preparation steps. Try to increase the blocking time. Also, increase the washing time and frequency could also help to reduce the background. Weak signal, or even bad, maybe you barely see anything on your images there. Most of the time, it caused by the low concentrations of your antibodies. Try to adjust the concentrations and increase it will help you. Some of the times, it caused by the low expressions of your target proteins. Choose tissues and cells with higher expressions. This will help you to get a better imaging. Some of the times, it caused by low permeability of cell. Increase the time of your experiment will help a lot. Make sure you choose the right selections to your secondary antibodies of that. Another common problem in your live cell imaging is quick photo bleaching. We always recommend to choose a high quality anti fluorescent contours or anti faded media for your mounting. Next one, auto fluorescence in your sample. Sometimes you are really bothered by that because you can barely see your signals in your samples, in your imaging. So please check the auto fluorescence before you're standing. Sometimes it is raised by your fixed additives and also the materials you used. Just check it, set up your control group and check it. The last point we want to talk about is the bad performance and the high magnification objectives in the microscopy. Sometimes we may get the images like this. It's fuzzy, not really clear. It may be related to the thickness of cover glass. Most objectives are designed to use 1.17 mm cover slip, like this. Using the wrong ones can serious implications for image intensities and overall qualities. Like they might reduce the contrast, reduce the resolutions, reduce the image intensities and all of those things. From this curve here, and there you can see the impact of the cover slip thickness. So please use the right one for your experiment. In the end, I wanted to take this opportunity to express my thanks to Yan Runchuan and Li Xiaoting. This presentation is based on their previous work in Zeiss China Cloud course. Also, thanks to China application team, Steve Zhang, Qiao Chen, Ma Yunchao, and Zhang Huayi for their support on this work. Thanks for your watching. 
If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact us. More important, practice is always helpful to experiment. Thank you and goodbye.